so my talk is a little bit more on the technical side, and uh, at USA Today, uh, we have uh, grown from just having one site on WordPress to having over 80 sites on WordPress over the course of the past uh, five years. Uh, and through that process uh, and, and growing our traffic to uh, over 50 million monthly uniques, um, we've picked up on a lot of things, and, and so I'm gonna try to pass uh, those off to you. Uh, but before I get, uh, dive into the, you know, the things that you can implement today, I uh, just want to go over a couple generals and uh, things that I, I think about when, uh, when talking about things like scalability uh, and, and site speed. Uh, so the first thing, obviously, uh, speed versus scalability. Uh, a lot of people think that these are very different, uh, and I kind of like to think of this as uh, them being almost uh, intertwined with each other. Uh, the, re the reason being is if your site's faster, uh, and uh, you're and uh, you're maybe loading less resources on each page load, then you're automatically going to be scaling your site. Uh, you can run your site on a uh, smaller server and uh, have more traffic without having to upgrade and go to the next uh, uh, pricing plan. Um, this is a tool that I always mention, at least uh, in most of my talks. So a web page test. Uh, uh, one, basically, uh, you can put any website into this and, and get an overview of uh, what is uh, being loaded on your on your website and uh, what is causing might be causing your site to slow down. So definitely, if, if you've never jumped on this, I definitely suggest uh, running your site through it at least one time. Um, so jumping back to scalability, the the real uh, thing I, I try to think about is traffic spikes because that's that's when you're you're going to have issues most of the time you know you're testing things hopefully and, and you're you're running through simulations and then you get a, a lot of traffic all of a sudden and up oh, something goes wrong and it's and, and you're thinking okay yeah maybe i just need to upgrade to the next plan but uh the way i like to look at it is that if your site has a single point of failure then everything's going to go down right so testing everything as a whole is one way of, of, of uh, scaling up your sites, but you also need to test each individual feature individually as well. Um, another thing I kind of like to think about is backend versus front-end. Uh, you know, if, if backend, uh, WordPress is built on a PHP for the most part, so a lot of that is running on your server, right? Uh, this is uh, gonna cause, uh, you know, this is, uh, if, if, you, if too much is running, on that side, uh, on each page load, then obviously your server could go down, or uh, you know, there's a, a whole slew of other issues. But I'll, that's why a lot of people are moving to doing a lot more things in, um, in JavaScript on the front end. Uh, this is running on your computer locally, so that way uh, it's not it's not affecting your server at all. So just uh, these are kind of the three categories I like to uh, approach when uh, talking about building up your network of sites and, uh, and, and making sure you're ready to handle a lot of traffic. Uh, first is focusing on speed, um, making sure your base is good. Um, second is best practices. Uh, and then the third is uh, finding the right tool set to make sure you're uh, either testing everything properly or um, uh, using the, the proper uh, uh, frameworks for uh, making sure everything's running uh, smoothly. So to jump into speed optimizations, the first thing that everybody should be doing here is caching their sites. Um, and the W3C total cache plugin was the one I used to use, but I know there's a lot of great ones out there. Um, they all essentially do the same thing, but there's several versions or several things that uh, that it will do. You can implement browser caching, so that way uh, your site uh, will, if you already downloaded a CSS file, you don't need to download it a second time. Um, things like, uh, and, and you can you know, break that with simply uh, adding like a little version number to the end of your URL, right? So that way that your, your, you know, your browser knows, hey, 
there's a new version. So you only download the new file when uh, changes have been made. Page caching is another very obvious one. Instead of uh, running, uh, going through all your PHP uh, code and spitting and then uh, pro processing um, all that data on every page load, uh, you can just save the output of the whole page. And, and quite often, just this all by itself will make your sites extremely scalable. Um, and then there's this awesome thing called WP Query. Uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with this. Uh, I mean, uh, the, your homepage is probably running this right now. You're loading the most recent articles. Um, you can actually cache um, everything that's happening in WP Query, so that way uh, you don't have to uh, uh, run this on every single page load. Uh, another smart thing to do is to minify your images. Um, there's plugins. Uh, out there for, uh, for this. Like, I know everybody talks about the Smush It plugin, but essentially whenever you upload a photo to your website, it automatically minifies it. Uh, and then there, you can do it by hand with uh, other tools like Image Optum and PNG Gauntlet. Um, using a CDN is another smart thing to look into. Um, I know Jetpack has a really cool one for images. Um, and essentially what a CDN does is it takes your uh, things like your media files and distributes them across servers around the world. So that way, if I'm in China, for instance, I'll go to the China server and, and download um, images from there. And uh, that way it's, it's less load on my own server. And, and quite often, uh, I mean, especially in Jetpack's case, for instance, uh, it's free. Uh, if you have not heard about PHP 7, you should probably upgrade to PHP 7. It's much faster. Again, uh, I mean, it's an automatic win. So I suggest doing that. Oh, and if you have a plugin that does not support PHP 7, I would probably, or a theme that doesn't support it, probably not going to want to be uh, on that theme or, or plugin for, uh, they probably, uh, they should be on that by now. Uh, Getting your site encrypted uh, on, on HTTPS and is, and that's where you see that little green lock at the uh, top part of your site. Um, that is, uh, that allows you to, uh, to activate HTTP2, which allows you to load several resources at the same time. And if, if you guys uh, remember that web page test image, um, before you only used to be able to load maybe eight things at once. But now you can load an almost an infinite amount of things at the same time. So automatically making your sites faster and more secure. So that, that's kind of setting your baseline, right? And then here's some best practices that we've implemented on our team at USA Today uh, that have enabled us to have less, not only less bugs, but also put out code that is more performant. Um, not using heavy plugins. So, again, we have 80 sites, or I mean, sometimes somebody wants to just activate a plugin on a single site. So, when somebody says, "Hey, this plugin solves all my problems," I think the the best default response to that is, "What is the problem that you're trying to solve?" And if this plugin, maybe only 5% of its of its code base is solving the problem, maybe you could either build it yourself or take out the pieces uh, that you, only take out the pieces that you need instead. Uh, and quite often you'll find, it, find that uh, after you bring it on, you'll be spending more time debugging and fixing issues uh, instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, building more uh, things for your platform. Same thing goes for themes, right? Um, if, uh, uh, quite often, uh, I mean, I've seen themes that, that will load 10, 15, 20 CSS files. And uh, you, can be simple, you can easily go to web page test, activate and deactivate your theme and see what's happening and get a good, and get a good feel for what's, what's working well, what isn't. Um, code review is, it was a big uh, upgrade for us. Uh, ever since we started, uh, review, uh, no code goes out unless it's reviewed by somebody else. Uh, really important as you grow a team. Um, I know a lot of uh, people when they're first starting off, they're saying, "Oh, like my, my I'm, I'm everything I'm writing is fine, but like the junior dev on our team's not doing so great. He's struggling." Well, the first thing I'm saying is, "Well, do you guys review each other's code, right?" 
it goes both ways. He should be reviewing your code so he can learn, but so he can learn, um, and you should be re reviewing his code so you can uh, actually say, hey, we, everything we pushed out was together. Um, oh, and this is a link to the VIP standards that we use on our team. Um, testing, obviously very important. Uh, people forget that like, it's, not just it's not just testing things locally or setting up WordPress locally, but you can have a QA environment and then also staging, which is uh, replicating a production as, clo as closely as possible. So usually uh, for us, we have these, all three of these uh, environments uh, before it even goes to production and we, we test in all three. Uh, monitoring. Um, so that that, pay, uh, that web page test tool that I showed you guys, they actually have uh, a CL, uh, or an API, so you can hit your web website over and over and over again. You can easily put that on a graph and and see if there's any spikes in page load for some reason. That's probably going to give you a good indication that something's wrong. Um, obviously, you should be monitoring monitoring your server. Uh, load and most hosting uh, services come with that feature built in. And then another one that's been interesting for our team is options. Um, we will actually take all of our options and put it in a single table. That way we can see uh, the options for all 80 of our sites on one page. And this was, was a, a big deal for us because uh, now we can see, hey, nobody's using this option anymore. Um, um, so that just getting uh, getting the team in sync with with those uh, th that kind of mindset is was what really allowed us to start making sure that we we didn't have issues on production and as we started uh, push uh, as we started getting better and faster uh, to maintain that standard as well. Um, so here's five tools that I thought that have been really interesting to me that stood out for scaling our sites. Um, Jetpack, like I mentioned before, uh, built by WordPress.com. A lot of amazing features. Just activating that, if you have nothing else, is going to be a huge win for you. Um, Elasticsearch is, very, is a very interesting like, uh, side topic. It's something to think about. Most people don't need to uh, do this, but if, you're, if your site has heavy search queries, uh, for instance, we have a site called uh, USA Today's uh, High School Sports, and we have, I mean... It's like, uh, I think it's a, a several hundred thousands of, of articles to, to go through. So this essentially puts, it, uh, puts the search results on a, a separate server, and uh, it's actually built in Java, and you're kinda, it returns results uh, uh, much quicker. Uh, Loader.io is a, a pretty interesting tool. Um, you can stress test your web apps and APIs with thousands of concurrent users. So before, you, you know, let's say you're expecting a big spike of traffic, um, this is a great way to start testing things out. Uh, and then another one that's been really interesting is Siege. Um, stress testing a single URL with uh, a defined number of simulated, uh, simulated users. Um, so again, uh, like I was mentioning before with the single point of failure, uh, it's, it's some, it's sometimes you, you think, okay, I'll just put a, a bunch of traffic to this, this web page. Um, but also, you, you, if you, let's say you have a login system, right, that's built by hand, you might want to stress test that all by itself. Because if that goes down, then everything else is going to go down, right? Um, another thing that's a hot topic right now is, is serverless. This is not a WordPress thing, but maybe it could be one day. Um, it's... It's essentially not having to think about uh, the your server uh, going down. Uh, put essentially, it lets, you can write your own code, put it in uh, up on. Uh, there's a lot of services that have this now, but uh, Google and Amazon are the top competitors in the field right now. And you just put your code up there and say, "Hey, I'm running this on PHP," and then it'll spin up as many servers as you need or spin, uh, spin them down as, as needed, or, and uh, it'll only run when you call it. Um, and then the bonus points, uh, load balancing, and this, is, and this is like, when you, when, when, I think once you get through everything else, you know, once you have the best practices in place, then you can start thinking about things like load balancing. And that's basically where uh, 
you pass everything to a load balancer, and as you, uh, if you get so much traffic, you need to spin up a new server, and then repli and then and then split the users between the two servers. Um, you know, I mean, honestly, that's a great problem to have. So at that point, you know, you can probably bring somebody in who knows what they're doing. Um, so that is it for me, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? In the front. Sorry about that. Uh, the question is, how did you approach onboarding for your editor? So getting these non-technical users comfortable with the uh, new experience? It's been a, it's actually been a really rewarding experience because the majority of ones that we've worked with have seen or heard of WordPress before. And they're so used to, in the antiquated system, like nothing works as it should. Things are labeled really weird over since like 1998. So it's like 1998. So it's, it's been a really good experience just because I think WordPress is so ubiquitous that even if maybe these legacy senior editors aren't 100% familiar with it, like someone in their newsroom or someone in their circle can say, oh yeah, like I've worked in WordPress before. I can show you how to log in. Um, and then in that same token, like, there, the documentation on just using and logging into WordPress and using the editor and using the pages is so good that we didn't have to go back and reinvent the wheel to do it. Like, we just said, hey, WordPress is like becoming a global standard. You know, it's, a, it's, it's something that people tend to just already know how to use. So that's been great. Not, not in the back, right? <coughs> Uh, also for Tyson, uh, so uh, for audience users browsing sites for the legacy system mm -hmm. and then they transition to the new special project site, right. are you creating an experience that, make, that, that highlights the fact that they're transitioning for, uh, to a new site or are you trying to have a consistent look and feel so that they, they just regard the special project site as uh, a part of that property? We're really trying to highlight the fact that they're changing. Um, so one of, the, I, one of the really nice features of our legacy CMS is that we can do a URL override on any story file that's in the system. So it'll appear on the traditional website like any other story, but when you click that link, you'll get a new tab and it'll be the special projects environment. But we don't wrapper it in the same header. We don't add the same footer. You know, we wanna make it look like a really special digital project. Um, and then we really encourage sites to link to social media so that people realize like, so that people realize like, okay, this is, this is a really big deal. And we had the same kind of question when we were launching the ads platform, right? Like most of our sponsored content has a sponsored label, but then in the end looks like a regular article. Um, but advertisers said like, no, we want people to think like, wow, this is a really nicely designed ad. This is a really good experience. Like the association with what the website normally looks like, it's we have found that people want to sort of shed it and they like seeing something that's special and unique. You mentioned earlier it's really important to review code for everyone. And I want to highlight and extend upon that. One of the tools we found incredibly helpful is our linting tools, so PHPCS and ESLint. Uh, it forces everyone to use a consistent style. You pick which one you want, and then that happens. And then you spend time in the code review discussing important things and concepts, uh, and you don't have to spend the time highlighting punctuation, spacing, variable naming, and so on, because your linter is already enforcing that. And it's gr these tools, not only can they tell you when you've done something wrong, but they can also fix many of the common errors automatically, uh, which is the kind of thing machines are great for and humans are lousy at. <laughs> so uh, I highly recommend if you're not using PHPCS or ESLint that you take a look at them uh, today or when you get back to work on Monday. Yeah, awesome, that's, that's a great point. And also uh, we do the same thing and, and we have this, we integrate it into GitHub too, which is pretty cool. And then it just like shows a little X or a little green checkbox, right? Um, so that way you don't, like what, you're, like you, what you were saying, you don't have to worry about pointing out spacing issues or variable name issues, that kind of stuff. Awesome. Any other questions? 
Thank you, David. Thank you, Tyson. Thank you.